Thank you for joining us. Education is more than reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's one of the most important causes, and its future is absolutely critical to reducing global poverty, ignorance, and unrest. Our guest today is Dr. Barbara Nemko, a famous visionary, leader in education, and in so many fields is actually an inspiration to so many. She is the Napa County, California Superintendent of Schools and has been selected by the Center for Digital Education as one of the top 40 innovators in education. We'll hear her views on transforming education following these messages. With us now, Superintendent Barbara Nemko. A real privilege to have you on the show again. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Barbara, we're living in a changing world where innovation and technology is having such a great influence on countries, people, individuals, and of course, education. What are your thoughts on this progress? It's amazing. It's wonderful. I think a lot of people rail against it and think that maybe we have a little too much technology. Uh, I occasionally think that when I have dinner with my grown niece and nephew and while we're all at the table they're texting each other underneath the table and we know they're texting comments about their dorky dad who's my brother and me. Uh, but it is so powerful and particularly what we're seeing in education, the change is phenomenal. It's great. Please tell us a little bit about your career, how you began in education. Oh, goodness. Um, well, I was 19 years old, and I graduated from Queens College to the University of New York, and I started as a second grade teacher in the New York City public schools. At age 19, I had a choice of second grade or sixth grade, and sixth grade, they were 12. They were bigger than I was. I'm only 5'2", so I said second grade. That was as much as I could handle. And I had 40 or 41 second grade students. They spoke 17 languages, four dialects of Chinese. I only spoke English, no aid. It was before the era of special education, so I had lots of special ed students mixed in. Uh, and I was totally, totally unprepared for what I was expected to do. What a challenge, and how things have changed since then, and how technology back in those days, if you could have brought it from the present time, would have made such a big difference. It would have been huge because I had one set of books and they were second grade books because that's what you had to use. So even though some of my kids didn't read at all or were on a pre-primer level, they were learning I and Sally and and, and some of the kids were reading on a fourth and fifth grade level, and some kids didn't speak any English. I had a kid from Israel and from Italy and from Korea and Japan and the Chinese kids, um, and one book. So some kids, were bored because it was so easy. Some kids struggled terribly because it was so hard. And I had no tools to be able to differentiate what I was doing. Today, I would have a book and I could touch something and it would change the language of the book. It would change the reading level of the book. So every child could be reading on his or her own grade level and in his or her own language. So the child who didn't speak any English there would be time that we would be teaching English during the day, but for content, for science and social studies and math, we could be teaching it in the child's native language, and the book would read itself to the child. How amazing is that? Equally amazing is the fact that here in California, you're the superintendent of Napa schools for, good Lord, uh, 20 years nearly, and typically I hear that superintendents don't last long in most areas. 
You are so highly acclaimed here. Tell us a little bit about your experiences here in Napa. Well, Napa is a very unique community, especially for this little New York girl, because we have five school districts in the county for a total of 20,000 students in our public school system in this county. I come from New York where we think in the millions, and it's very different to be in a place where if you go to the supermarket, you're going to meet five teachers that you know and 10 parents. And everybody wants to engage in a discussion of education. It's wonderful to have that kind of a relationship and to be able to do, county superintendents have a unique job. We're not like district superintendents. We're actually elected. And to be, we can, there are some things we have to do. And then there are a lot of things that we can create because we want to do them. And that gives us greater freedom than I think a district superintendent has because the district superintendent has to report to the board that hired them. I have a board, but they didn't hire me. The public hires me. They can't fire me. The public has to do that. And so I can be as creative as I want with things that make sense and introduce all kinds of things. For example, uh, we do something called Napa County Reads. It's a marvelous opportunity to get the whole community reading the same book and to do a series of events around that book and bring the author to the county. We've been doing that for 11 years. We started an adopt a school program with our vintners about 12 years ago and wineries, and I was a little nervous, how would people react to wineries adopting schools, but in Napa County, not a problem. <laughs> if they tried to do that in Southern California, I'm not sure, but in Napa, that was just fine. And the wineries established a relationship with the school and all we said is invite the teachers twice a year and say thank you for what you're doing for our kids. And anything else you want to do beyond that, that's up to you. And we've had wineries that send people into the schools to work with kids. They help the schools with fundraisers. They participate in jogathons. They do all kinds of things. Uh, so now we have the vintners actually donating large sums of money to the schools, and they formed a public-private partnership with us to raise money so that we can make the kind of transformation that we need, buy the kind of technology that we need, and buy the professional development and the coaching that teachers need in the classrooms. We couldn't do that without our business partners. Speaking of community support, I was absolutely amazed by the beauty of, and of this fantastic uh, campus you have in the American Canyon High School. It's phenomenal. I've never seen a school like that. Well, the school opened in 2010, so it is new. And it was designed very specifically for the new kind of learning. Uh, Napa County is proud to say that we started the very first new technology high school. We opened it in 1996. And again, that was a result of working with our business community, because our business partner said, we can't hire your graduates. They don't have the skills we're looking for. We have to tell them what to do. That's not how we operate a business. We want people who can think, who can anticipate what needs to be done, who can think outside the box, who can solve problems and not always bring them to their supervisor and say, well, I don't know what to do now because this is the problem that came up. So we want a new kind of high school and we want you to design it and we'd like to see it as soon as possible. So it only took us six years, but we did open it and it was a very small school for 200 kids who were juniors and seniors. But that new tech high school that opened in 1996 has spawned about 180 of that model around the country. And in Napa, that was our only school like that. Even though the rest of the country was multiplying it, we were not. So when it came time to build a new school for the American Canyon community, it was clear that that had to be like a New Tech High, but it was going to be a neighborhood school. At New Tech High, people apply to go there. They know it's going to be problem solving, project-based learning, integrated technology. At American Canyon High School, that's my school because I live here. But it was the same kind of school, so it was built with the capability of all the technology. You know this, the solar panels on the roof. Um, it's entirely heated and cool through all the energy that they collect and save, and I think they sell a lot back to PG&E. Um, you saw the sheep that take care of the grass. Uh, it, it's just an amazing school. It's won many awards for its environmental sensitivities. This is also very fascinating, and of course, education holds the key for a better future for all of mankind, humanity, I should say. 
In Israel, necessity breeds excellence, it is said, and there are institutions there such as the Technion and other, and uh, a succession of highly creative individuals produce amazing technologies. In fact, the, the iPhones, the computers, the uh, central processing units in all of the PCs that we have originated in Israel of all places. So what are your thoughts with regard to the end product of STEM education leading to amazing inventions and products and processes that enhance mankind, really? Well, I think first it's incredible to me how um, Israel doesn't get the credit for how many of today's modern, uh, not conveniences, but uh, discoveries that they've been responsible for. So many medical discoveries, so many advances also in weaponry and in surveillance and all the things that they find essential to keep them from being wiped off the face of the earth, but people never talk about that. They just don't get the credit that they deserve for all of the things that they have created and invented. Um, and now we're realizing how important it is that we have more engineers and creative thinkers because uh, everything is changing. And it has to change. We cannot continue to do things the way we did them 100 years ago, which is pretty much what we're still doing in a lot of areas. And so we're going to see uh, cars that drive themselves and possibly cars that fly. And it's, it's within our lifetime. I think we're, we're seeing prototypes of that right now, many of which do come from Israel. So we want our kids to start inventing stuff. Um, I was at, a, at Calistoga Elementary the other night, and they had an evening called Engineer and Invent for parents and kids. And everybody was doing something, building something. The buzz in the room was fantastic. And when you think about the old-fashioned parent meetings that used to take place at school where the parents would come in and sit, and somebody would lecture at them, and then they'd go home and say to their kid, now you need to do something this way, that's not what's happening. Now we're working together and we're creating, and it's exciting. And you could hear parents telling kids, you don't need that much tape to put that together, or kids telling parents, you don't need to do it this way, let's try it that way. That's the way we move forward. The need to transform education and science, technology, engineering, and math STEM education so essential. Absolutely. I think about the way I learned math, which was basically you walked into class and the teacher said, this is how you add mixed fractions. And she showed us the prototype. And then she said, OK, now solve the next 22 problems. And you did it exactly that way. What was missing was where would I use this? How would this come up in the real world? What would I do with it? So if you suddenly gave me a problem that didn't lay it out in a particular way, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. That's not learning math. That's, I, a trained monkey can learn how to do that, and, and that's how I was taught math. So it's extremely exciting to see kids today doing project-based learning where they're using the math to solve a problem to do a project. And the other thing with technology, there's an incredible website called NEPRIS, N-E-P-R-I-S, that's free for teachers to use, where if I am that middle school math teacher and I am teaching mixed fractions, I can go online and find an architect or an engineer or a landscape gardener or and say, how do you use mixed fractions in your job? And they will Skype into the class and talk to the kids and tell them how they use it. So for kids who have always asked that question, you asked it when you were in school, I asked it when I was in school, why do I need to know this? There's your answer. And yet so much of the world is plagued by obscurantism, irrationalism, and fundamentalism, whereas education, what you are representing here today, is the answer for a better future. I think we are moving into a much better place. I see such hope for education. I see our ability to teach kids that we were not successful with before. I see that we're going to be successful with them in the future, and we need every kid to have a good education. We're going to get there. Thank you so very much for being with us. Thank you. Wonderful to hear your views on this. And you are an inspiration to so very many people throughout the education system in the United States and should be everywhere else in the world. Thank you again. Thank you.
gentlemen, let's welcome Superintendent Barbara Nemko. Good morning. As you just heard, I'm Barbara Nemko. I'm the Napa County Superintendent of Schools. This is Jeanette Luters, and she is a preschool teacher for the Napa County Office of Education. And we are going to talk to you about what has become one of the hottest topics around, and that is early literacy. So how many of you have children? How many of you remember when you brought that baby home from the hospital? Do you remember talking to the baby? <laughs> what did you say? Songs. You sang songs. Wonderful. What did you say? I love you so much. <laughs> ah, what did you say? I babbled all day. I talked to that baby. I narrated the day. From the minute we walked into the house, it was, ooh, wait till you see your new room. Look at the mural on the wall. Do you see the giraffes? Aren't they big and tall? I just babbled all day long. And now we're going to get ready to go to bed, and we're going to put on your pajamas. And Grandma's coming tomorrow, and isn't that going to be exciting? And I just talked and talked. Any of you remember doing that? <laughs> and so we kind of assume that everybody does that. And my daughter, who now is 40, 43, um, I, I don't remember thinking about early literacy at that time. You know, we just, it was just a natural part of what I did. But by the time my nephew was born, I had this aha moment. He's 26 now, but when he was two, we were having a conversation at his house. And it involved something about what we were going to do for that day. And everybody was talking in paragraphs, you know. And, uh, yeah, I think we're going to take the bus and we're going to go to here. And then after that, we're going to do this. He was two years old. And suddenly I went, oh, my God. Because by then I'd been teaching for a long time. How is a kid who comes from a family that doesn't speak English as their native language and who isn't talked to and who it doesn't have books read how are they going to do in the kindergarten class next to Max, who's been talked to and read to and has a vocabulary that, and I had that thought. It was a real aha moment. And then I had no idea what to do about it, so I forgot about it. It was just kind of an awareness. And suddenly, fast forward 24 years, and you see that everybody is talking about this. And everybody is talking about the achievement gap. And as teachers, I take it very personally when I hear that schools somehow create an achievement gap. And I'm thinking, wait, wait, I'm not so sure we do that. I think what we do is we narrow the achievement gap. I think that what happens is we get students who come to school with a huge achievement gap, and we are trying to fix that for the next 13 years. Well, suddenly, we're not the only ones, not just teachers saying that, other people are saying that. And so we have a little message from Hillary Clinton on that very topic. Behind these doors, America's future is being shaped. Inside, you'll find some of the world's most important teachers Libraries, where any book on the shelf is an instant classic. And the most eager students anywhere. These aren't Ivy League universities, they're homes. And new research shows that what happens here during the first five years of your child's life will make a difference for the rest of his or her life. Inside the brain, Amazing things are happening. The research is very powerful and the science is very compelling. Early experiences have a huge impact on the development of the brain. This is a time when the foundations of all the health and learning and behavior that are gonna follow for a lifetime are being built that literally affect the development of all those connections among brain cells, 700 connections per second in the early months and years of life that ultimately form the circuits and the architecture of the brain. It turns out that what we do every day as parents, talking with our kids, hugging them, singing a lullaby, or reading a bedtime story, has a lasting impact. The science is clear. We know that positive experiences and interactions enhance brain development, while traumatic experiences and toxic stress literally stunt brain development. And a healthy start, like a mom taking the right amount of folic acid while she's pregnant, or a child receiving a healthy diet to prevent childhood obesity and diabetes 
That is the recipe for long-term success. Our country's future depends on healthy kids and loving families. They're the building blocks of a strong and prosperous society. We've got big challenges. Our students are falling further and further behind in math and science, but we can fix it. The research shows that the early years really matter. Getting them excited, getting them wanting to learn about what's out there. If we get it right, they're hooked on either math or science. That's huge, not just for our kids, but for the future of our country. Raising a family is hard work, and it's important to know that you are not alone. There are resources to help and simple steps that parents, preschools, businesses, and communities can take to help our kids succeed, because we're all in this together. And that's what the Too Small to Fail initiative is all about. The most important place for children is the home, what their parents do but we all have a role to play. Right now, parents and families, they're really struggling to meet their needs of their children and the demands of their employer. And what we know is that some employers are helping them. They're making modest adjustment to workplace policies. And what they're seeing is healthier families, happier employees, a more productive workforce. We wanna see that trend continue to work with the private sector in partnership to make that happen. It's little things early on that can make a huge difference later on. You know, right now our country's never been more connected, whether it's Google or Twitter or Facebook. There's this incredible connectivity and technology out there that can transform lives. But we have to marry those tools and that technology with the right kind of research so that parents and families and schools and businesses have the information they need to give kids the chance they deserve in life. Every parent has looked into their newborn baby's eyes and seen unlimited potential. And now we know how to help them achieve that. Too Small to Fail is all about giving parents, families, businesses, and communities the tools we need to help all our children succeed. So please join us for the future of our kids and the future of our country. So that would make it sound easy because what she's describing is your family and you've already done that. So one of the things that I heard about four years ago was a digital early literacy program called Footsteps to Brilliance. And Footsteps to Brilliance was created exactly for this, to help close the gap by giving kids the opportunity to hear stories on a device where the stories read themselves to the child, but the child interacts with the stories. Now, this is important because, at least among the parents that we frequently see in Napa County, they would love to read to their children, but many of our families are not literate in Spanish. So they can't read English and they can't read Spanish. It isn't that they don't want to, but they can't. So what we are providing is the opportunity for them to put the child on their lap and read a story out loud, except the device is doing the actual reading. We started in 2011 with a very small pilot program. We took 16 students who had not been to preschool and were not from English-speaking households, and they were in a four-week summer boot camp and we introduced Footsteps to Brilliance. We had to import a teacher to teach the class. It was in Calistoga, and there was no one in Calistoga. 2011, remember that? iPads were invented in 2010, which is hard to believe when we feel like, how did we ever live without them? But that's when they came out. There was nobody, no teacher who knew how to use an iPad, so we brought one in from somewhere else. And the kindergarten teachers came in, and they were angry on their own time, because they knew that this was the dumbest thing they ever heard of, because screen time is bad for kids, and what were we thinking, and these are preschool kids, and they should be out singing and playing, but they shouldn't be looking at a screen. And within two days of observing what was going on in that classroom, we gave them pom-poms, and they became our cheerleaders, because they were 
astounded, flabbergasted at the level of engagement that the students had with this program, the interaction that they had. And in that first little four-week program, we got so excited that we invited the state superintendent, Tom Torlakson, to come down. We had people coming in every day. And here are these little kids, and their first time they've been in, in school at all. And we would have sometimes 16 kids and 20 adults standing around them. And when we adults got rude and were too noisy talking to each other, instead of getting distracted, these kids would say, my headphones, please. And they put on their headphones to block out our noise so they could continue paying attention to what they were doing. This brings us to the end of our special program for today from On Location in the San Francisco area. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us. Yeah.